chameleons change their their identity you know they change their appearance to 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 match what's going on in the environment to blend in with the environment and and you know as i've been doing research on consumers for many years and you know uh, companies will ask me to give a keynote about you know the latest in consumer behavior i began to realize that that a lot of the basic and, and i mean really basic assumptions we make about consumers and about the marketplace really, really don't fit anymore because people are becoming what I think of as these chameleons. Of course, our it's not our uh, exterior that's, or at least our skin that's changing, uh, but our identities are changing. As we go throughout a, a, a typical day, we play different roles. You know, we have to be the the devoted husband or the or the devoted father or the good employee or the you know the great date or what, whatever uh one of the most important facets of any business is customer service in business you are not only selling a product or a service but an experience providing exceptional customer service and developing real relationships with your clients means increased sales retain customers new customers via word of mouth and a positive reputation you're listening to the focus on customer experience podcast Podcast. benjamin del grosso gives you the ins and outs of one of the most underlooked aspects in business today improve your customer service and watch your business skyrocket two one now here's your host benjamin del grosso Hello and welcome to the show. Today we have Michael Solomon. And today we're going to talk about customer engagement. And I know customer engagement is a very big thing. So even the other day, I went into a white spot restaurant and I went in there to eat with my family. We went in there. We were not really greeted that well. We sat down. We waited 10 minutes. No one came back to the table. Nobody asked us if we wanted drinks. So we actually walked out. Nobody engaged us. The manager even watched us walk out. Didn't ask why we were leaving. You know, so today we're going to talk a lot about customer engagement and other topics. So Michael Solomon, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me on. And uh, sorry, your family couldn't get dinner. Yeah, well, we went and ate at Subway because if we're not going to get service, I'll we'll just go somewhere where we can get food <laughs> for half the price. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, uh, Michael, tell us a little bit more about what you do and where you're from. Sure. Well, I'm um, I'm currently a uh, professor of marketing at St. Joseph's University in Philadelphia, and I I specialize in in research on consumer behavior. Uh, I'm a psychologist by training, but I've been uh, I've been a professor in, in business schools for uh, for all of my career. Um, but in addition to that, I've had the opportunity to work with uh, with a lot of great companies to make them more customer centric. So uh, you know, it's all it's all about understanding what your customers want. You know, you can start by giving them a menu in your case, but uh, you know, it goes a little <laughs> deeper than that. But uh, you know, I. Even even the biggest companies sometimes sometimes struggle to really connect with their customers, especially because things are changing so quickly today. And we you know we hear that every day, but it really is true, and it's especially true when we look at consumer behavior and and some of the really big changes that have occurred. Uh, by the way, you know, starting before the pandemic, but of course the pandemic, you know, kind of threw threw fuel on the fire for some of these. So. Uh, we're seeing some huge changes. Companies, big and small, are trying to figure them out, and uh, hope I can help a little bit. Yeah, like a lot of these. Um, I don't know what what you want, what I want to say here, but I was in Walmart the other day, and you know they have those like fast checkouts for like you know ten or fifteen items. Right. They've now added in checkouts for however big your shopping cart is. And now they have a big area where you can put all your groceries on and scan them. And I'm like, so are they completely trying to eliminate that position now? Right. It's like, we're completely trying to replace humans. Like that's a job that would be, you know, let's call it here. I think it'd be 15 bucks an hour starting, you know, somebody who might rely on that job would bring home about $30,000 a year. And that job's going to disappear by a machine. Right. You know, so, I mean, we have all these different things that are happening 
with as a result of the pandemic, like you were bringing up. So do you think people want to have that customer engagement of somebody, you know, scanning, you know, their, Mm -hmm. their food and having a conversation, or do you think machines are going to kind of take over? (laughs) You know, uh, probably a little bit of both. I mean, you know, it, I don't think you can just call it one way or the other because it depends on the, on the type of job and, you know, uh, like it or not, uh, you know, checking out, checking out at a, at a Walmart probably doesn't require a human. Of course, it's all about making customers work harder for the company, right? Because they're doing the job that they used to pay the the checkout people to do. Um, but you know, I'm, a more optimistic view is that is that all of this new technology is going to free people up to do work that that does require humans. You know, uh, AI, artificial intelligence can't do anything, everything. It can win a chess game, but it it can't necessarily ask anyone out on a date. You know, it's, it's, it's still, you still got to have that human component in there. And so actually, you know, a lot of the, uh, a lot of interesting issues today revolve around not, not whether that's going to happen because it is going to happen, you know, more of this technology and, and automate automation in the customer experience process, but maybe how that should be integrated and what it should look like, you know? So, I mean, for example, there are already robots that are being used in some stores. Uh, The Japanese are really big on this uh, uh, bank tellers and so on that are being replaced by robots. Uh, One of the issues is, you know, what should that robot look like? You know, should it, should it look (laughs) like something from lost in space or, or should it be dressed up like an Android, you know, um, so that we barely know it's not human. And they're, there's a lot of interesting things going on there that we could talk about, but but clearly uh, uh, most marketers aren't prepared for the the, the invasion of, of automation that's going to come, and we're just seeing the beginning of it now. Yeah, there's there's a lot of artificial intelligence happening, even in marketing. There's all these, you know, AI writers now that'll like write for you, right? Yeah. And I have a different of opinion, difference of opinion, I guess, when it comes to AI writing. Uh, is that something that you see a lot of the marketing companies starting to use now or? Well, again, you know, I think they're doing it at, at a very low level, uh, you know, write, writing, for example, uh, you know, a, a newspaper story about a, about a baseball game where they just have to fill in the score, you know, but everything's been written by the by the machine. Um, so, yeah, you know, we, we are seeing more of that. Um, you know, uh, job and inter- people who apply for jobs now at big companies, uh, you know, routinely the, they're going to scan the resumes for certain words. The, you know, in other words, the AI is going to analyze that, uh, that resume before a human ever looks at it. So at those lower levels of, you know, filtering out a lot of information and, and doing menial tasks and so on. Yeah. You know, we're, we're definitely in the next five years, we're going to be seeing more and more of that. And of course, there's an example where the pandemic really, uh, you know, fueled the fire that was already burning before. When you think about people's reluctance to buy online or to deal with call centers and things like that. Um, I'm not saying that we're thrilled to do it these days, but uh, but a lot of people who wouldn't have wanted to do that before the lockdown are, are now much more comfortable, you know, uh, dealing with a call center or ordering their groceries online. And they have no idea who's on the other end. Yeah. Yeah, that is very true that a lot of times people are just ordering online. I mean, uh, what is it? DoorDash and Uber Eats and all these places. I mean, my friend works for Uber Eats and he's telling me all about, you know, the amount of business that they're doing and how everything keeps growing. And, you know, a lot of these companies that have been, you know, mom and pop restaurants for many years and had no interest in ever building a website now an uber eats doordash these kind of companies come in there and they literally build a website kind of for you showing your menu where they can order and get it delivered to your door and even a friend of mine in phoenix was telling me somebody will order a three dollar coffee and pay five dollars to have it delivered to their door he goes it doesn't make sense but people are buying it over and over and over again right so um you know consumer behavior has changed you know, quite, quite a bit. Right. And so, I mean, you know, you have a new book called the new chameleons, right. How to connect with consumers who defy categorization. 
So right. could you tell us a little bit more about that and, and what your book is about? Yeah, I'd be, I'd be happy to. Uh, so probably everybody knows what a chameleon is. And, um, you know, the reason I chose that metaphor is that chameleons change their their identity. You know, they change their appearance to 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 match what's going on in the environment, to blend in with the environment. And, and you know, as I've been doing research on consumers for many years and, you know, uh, companies will ask me to give a keynote about, you know, the latest in consumer behavior. I began to realize that that a lot of the basic and, and I mean really basic assumptions we make about consumers and about the marketplace really really don't fit anymore because people are becoming what I think of as these chameleons. Of course, our it's not our uh, exterior that's or at least our skin that's changing, uh, but our identities are changing as we go throughout a, a, a typical day. We play different roles. You know, we have to be the the devoted husband or the or the devoted father or the good employee or the you know the great date or what, whatever uh different situations uh that we run into <clears throat> each of those requires uh, a very different set of products and services to make to make them happen and and so in the old days you know we used to and we teach our students and i still do this you know we teach our students about market segmentation about this idea of broadcasting, you know, picking a large, uh, you know, significant group of people who share some characteristic, like, you know, women in their 20s or something, and then we target them with various messages. That kind of approach to marketing really worked well back when we lived in a broadcasting kind of a kind of world, you know, where there were maybe three or four television stations, uh, you know, a few radio stations, etc. But of course, today we live in a we've moved from a broad, broadcasting model to what we call a narrow casting model, where each of us pretty much can design our own experience. You know, the 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 online stuff that we interact with, the, the people we talk to, the stores, the places we we check out uh, are very individualized and people don't want just to have these, uh, you know, this kind of cookie cutter approach. Um, imposed on them. So, uh, you know, back in the day, General Motors was actually the company that invented market segmentation, you know, which was a response to when Henry Ford famously said, uh, you know, my customers can have a co my car in any color they want, as long as it's black. Uh, <laughs> you know, General Motors said, well, not everybody wants the same car. So they developed different divisions, you know, for people with different income levels, et cetera, like Chevrolet and Cadillac. Um, and, and that worked really, really great in the 40s, 50s, you know, in the last century. But, but today, each of us is, is much more unique and each of us is much more proactive about searching out the kind of information that, that we want to receive. So, so basically what I talk about in, in the book, in The New Chameleons, uh, is I've identified a, a set of very basic categories that marketers use all the time that no longer make any sense. Uh, I'll give you some examples of, of what I mean by that. Uh, one of those would be, let's say, producer versus consumer. So we used to believe that, you know, if, if you're making something, the the customer only sees it at the very, you know, when it's totally 100% perfect and ready to be sold. But today, what we see is that, in fact, a lot of customers, and rightly so, get involved actually in the marketing process, you know, whether uh, to, you know, you were talking about DoorDash and all that, you know, we have everyday people now becoming food delivery people or chauffeurs or hotel keepers, you know, things like that. Uh, but people are also creating their own ads. They're posting, obviously posting many, you know, millions of hours of reviews about products online. And, and some companies are, have realized that, you know, their customers are actually the best, their best source for new product development ideas. Like uh, Lego, for example, has about 10,000 customers that it gets feedback from and uses those ideas, you know. So that that's an example. Uh, another one, uh, you know, pretty doesn't get more basic than this male versus female. You know, we've we've we believe in our society that you're one or the other. You know, you were born male or female and that's what you are. But obviously today there's so many conversations about the fluidity of gender. And, you know, is there such a thing as being 
biologically male or female, or can you be a mixture? And, and in fashion, we see a lot of, you know, androgynous fashions that men and women are wearing, et cetera. Uh, so that there's an example of, of course, many segmentation strategies are built around gender. You know, if you, your customers are either male or female predominantly. And sometimes what that means is, you know, in today's world, if you're only focusing, let's say on women, uh, uh, let's say women, let's say you sell accessories and you're sell, selling them only to women. Well, you know, you're ignoring changes in our culture that that legitimize the use of accessories by more and more men, you know, like man bags and bracelets that men wear, necklaces, things like that. Um, and so there's just one example where, you know, you're, you're kind of you've kind of got blinders on and you're missing out on the potential for for other customers because people are no longer tied to those categories. And so, you know, the book goes through a lot of those young versus old, uh, flesh versus machine. Uh, you know, there's there's lots of, of basic categories, black versus white, uh, you know, uh, it the these the basic age categories that we that we often use, you know, my customers are in their 20s or my customers are senior citizens. A lot of those basic assumptions have have really become obsolete, but many companies oh, yeah. have not caught up with that idea. Well, you know, you look at, you know, to kind of go back, because you were talking about, you know, back in the day, 40s, 50s, 60s, or whatever, right? You know, back in the day, you had big companies like Coca-Cola, Pepsi, General Motors, and literally those guys owned the media. They did all their, they'd had, they did marketing. Uh, right. I mean, internet didn't exist yet. So it was newsprint, it was radio, it was TV, right? And then the internet came along and now anybody can advertise online. And you can, if you know how to, you know, manipulate the algorithm, you can do it for free too, right? And and, and do stuff, right? However, it, you, the only thing that's going to take is your time. But all that keeps changing, right? Because now all these smaller businesses and other companies can leverage social media. And, you know, in, when you had to try and get that information, like, so let's say you're Pepsi or Coke and you're, you're in the fifties or whenever they were around. Right. And you advertise and you want to know who your client is. You have to take like surveys now, right? You either have to have somebody in the store back in the day asking, and what's the average age of the person in the house that's drinking this? And you know, how much do you consume a week? And you have to find that out to find out who you're nowadays. I literally look at my Google ad listing and it'll tell me 25 to 34 is 25% of the people visiting your website, you know, of the age group, 15% of it is, is, is buying from you. I mean, the analytics that are available from like a Facebook and Google and, you know, all these different social media platforms now is just crazy. Right. So it's giving you who your customer is quite easier now and I understand why you're saying that some of this information is is kind of irrelevant and outdated compared to what it used to be, because you don't have to go digging for it anymore, right? A lot of it's very easily accessible at your fingertips, right? Uh, yeah, I mean, I would I agree with what you're saying for the most part, but it's important to qualify what you said because um, the, the what you can get by you know what you're doing, which is you know sometimes called web scraping or something like that, where we're just uh, looking at post at at uh, you know login data etc. Um, it does tell you who is buying your product, but what it doesn't tell you is why they're buying your product, and that's where you know you mentioned surveys and so on. That stuff you know uh, doing doing more directed research like that is still very important. You cannot get all the answers just by knowing what people do, but rather you need to know why they do it because uh, they might be, they might be trying to satisfy some underlying need. And it happens that your product is fitting that need right now. But if that changes and it probably will, because everything changes, you're kind of caught flat footed because you, you, you don't know what people were really looking for. You just know that uh, you know, the majority of them were between the ages of X and Y and so on. So it's important to do both. You know, it's it's great to do the kind of, of uh, analytics that you're talking about, um, but it's often very useful to understand, let, let's say, to do more qualitative research where you really 
talk to people and say to them, well, okay, I see you, you know, I see you, you bought my dash cam. <laughs> uh, why, you know, uh, why didn't you choose the other guy? And, you know, what, what is it about this product that really floats your boat and so on? Uh, it's so important to do that and not to make assumptions. You know, what, what tends to happen is that a lot of brand managers just assume that their customers are exactly like them. And so if I like it, they must like it. You know, but the, the, the reality is that, that very often uh, our customers are not like us. And so it becomes very dangerous to impose our own mindset on them. So you have to be very careful about that. Yeah, and don't assume that you you can predict what your customers will do tomorrow just because you've measured what they do today. And that that's why it's so important to enlist customers in that process to work with you and say, hey, how is my product? You know, how is the world changing? Are you feeling like my product is still meeting your needs? You know, you're looking for maybe a different solution now. And how can we evolve to help with that? So. Uh, you know, the marketing graveyard is full of big companies. So I don't mean little mom and pop, you know, I mean, big <laughs> companies that basically scored a marketing success. And then they said, OK, we can now, you know, rest on our laurels and just count the, the money when it comes in. And and what they what they fail to understand is that people are going to innovate and keep moving on. And so oh, just yeah. because you have a winning product today doesn't mean that five years from now, you know, that product will be uh, will be appropriate, you know. So for for example, one thing that the pandemic did is it kind of, again, lit the fire under this growing interest in let's in sustainability, you know, environmental, environmentally friendly products and, and all of that. Uh, you know, if if you brought out a product 10 years ago, you didn't really worry about making a green claim on that product. So you might have built a brand that had nothing to do with sustainability. But today, you know, the first I can tell you the first thing my students, you know, when they look at a at a product, first question they ask is, you know, how sustainable is that product? Because I can buy other products that are sustainable. So I'm going to always choose one that is if possible. So the point the point is that that our values change, our priorities change, whether we have a pandemic or we're just living in our normal crazy world. Uh, things change so rapidly that we can't afford to be caught just looking in the rear view mirror we always need to be looking out the front yeah things things keep changing i mean we look at like desktop was such a huge thing for desktop computers for many years and now over the i want to say the last five years i could be wrong on on that number it's been mobile first everything's like an ipad or iphone or whatever first and i mean i was just recently listening to joe rogan's uh interview with mark zuckerberg and they're talking about having eyeglasses that you would wear where someone can text you and you could like move your wrist a certain way and it'll automatically respond to them by somehow, I don't know, reading what you're saying. And and Joe's saying like, isn't that going to be like a huge distraction? But I mean, can you imagine that technology comes out? You're sitting there, you're having lunch with somebody and now you can. And if that takes off, now mobile yeah. first is gone. It's going to turn to like, I don't know, you're wearing these glasses or something. And there'll be different styles, polarized, black, red, green, every single color of the rainbow, right? So technology yeah. keeps changing. And I mean, we could see, you know, mobile not being yeah. a big thing anymore, maybe 10, 15 years right. down the road. Well, I <laughs> you know, I mentioned, you know, one of the categories I talk about is flesh versus machine. And increasingly what we're doing is we're we're merging with machines you know many many of us have uh have man-made parts you know whether we're wearing a pacemaker or artificial limb or something like you know uh, uh artificial hip or something like that but 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 also things like this whether whether it's wearables and you know and what you're describing already has you know that that's already out there you know google google glass was out a few years ago, they had to take it off the market because people thought it was too creepy for the reasons that you're talking <laughs> about. But but now they do, you know, they're selling it in industrial uh, uh, settings uh, where where you can superimpose information. So, for example, you can see a line where you need to run the saw, you know, things like that that come out of your glasses. Uh, but that stuff, that stuff will come back Um and, and yeah, you know, with with the different wearables that we have, you know, we have people they're selling 
They're developing contact lenses for, for people with diabetes that monitor your insulin levels. Uh, you know, all kinds of, of amazing advances that are a little scary because we've been watching sci-fi movies about how robots <laughs> are going to take over the world for many years. Terminator. You know, the Earth still <laughs> and, all, and all that. So we're very ambivalent about how we deal with robots and, and, and all, but um, but clearly there's so many ways that our bodies are, are going to be changing. I mean, we're using our bodies as billboards. You know, people are getting tattoos of, of lots of things, but, you know, there's a number of people who get tattoos of brand logos on their bodies. And what does that tell you about brand loyalty? So they're kind of becoming one with the brand. And, and uh, yeah, so in, increasingly, I, I think you're right. I mean, who knows, but I think in 10 or 15 years, we'll look back, you know, if we're still around, <laughs> we'll look back and say, imagine we used to carry these devices around. It was so bulky. I had to hold it in my hand, you know. Now I just lift up my wrist and I can see a hologram come up and and uh, tells me what I have to do today and and all that. You know? Oh so, man, you know who's winning from all this this technology is, <laughs> is the is the chiropractors and the physiotherapists uh, because this go. is this is exactly what everybody's doing. Is they're looking down at their phone and I was looking I was looking the other day. I'm driving around and I see all these people and they're leaning down, you know, on the bus stop benches and everything. I'm going. Mm-hmm man, those chiropractors and physiotherapists must be making a killing because nobody wants to, they're they're not sitting up like this. Right. Right. So it'll be, it'll be interesting 10, 15 years from now when that goes away, it'll be, you know, why didn't we have this, you know, 10, 15 years ago, right. We wouldn't have all these people with, you know, spinal cord just issues because of how they were sitting and, you know, it's all these kind of funny things. People (laughs) walking into cars because they're texting and not looking. Yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, there's been lots of funny things like that. Right. So yeah, it's, it's, it's a different way to look at just how technology has changed us. I feel that a lot of businesses have become way too reliant on technology uh, Mm -hmm. to the point of where like a a CRM literally runs their business. Mm -hmm. You know, I I had someone recently tell me um, that basically the CRM, when a lead comes in, auto sends them a text message. It calls them. And if they pick up, it'll say, blah, blah, blah. We've gotten your thing. We're going to be sending you an email. If you would like to talk to us, push this number and it will connect you with a person. Like it's so automated to the mm-hmm. point. And, and they're like, yeah, so that like, it's like spam, 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 text, email, call. And I'm like, wow, that's crazy. I said, well, what happens if someone's not there to answer the phone when the lead comes in at 2 a.m. in the morning? Oh, well, you know, then, you know, we have it timed where it will call, you know, the next morning at 9 a.m. I'm like, what if they work night shift, right? Like there's all these kind of, you know, different things kind of going on. Some places even have call centers that are open 24 hours a day. It's so different how automated everything has become, right? Well, it's, you know, it's a conflict between high tech and high touch. And, you know, one one scenario is that we're increasingly moving toward a, a polarized society and I, not polarized based on politics, but on income and social class where people who can afford it will get personalized service from humans. And, you know, the rest of us will, will you know, for relatively low ticket orders and so on, uh, will will be exposed to more automation. And, and you can see this already. You know, I've, I've read, uh, I can't vouch for the accuracy, but I've read a f- couple of articles that many of the high tech, uh, you know, executives in Silicon Valley send their kids to schools where computers are not allowed. They don't want them on their phones all day long like they see everybody else. So for their own kids, they want more of a high touch, you know, situation, but they can afford that, right? Because <laughs> they've made so much money on the high tech, um, you know, so we basically, we have to decide what what makes sense to automate and, and what doesn't. And, and again, I think, you know, the rosier picture is that this frees up people to uh, away from manual, uh, menial work to do more kind of thought work and, and let the machines do the lower level qualifying and and so on in the sales process. It seems like, you know, being that you, uh, you, you work at a university is what you said, right? Mm-hmm. So do you think that there's going to be a push for re-education for some of these workers that are, that are at, at the bottom to get re-educated, especially if the machines are taking over? 
because there is a lot of people in the tech sector that are building these machines. So there are jobs being created at a higher paying level to build this technology, but there must be some sort of a push for uh, re-education so that these people are still uh, utilized in, in other uh, positions within within a company, right? Right. Yeah. And I mean, you're you're definitely seeing those conversations, uh, you know, about re-education, uh, especially in some industries like like truck driving, right, where where uh, self-driving trucks are, you know, they're they're ahead of self-driving cars. Right. They're they're already doing that uh, for long haul. And so how do you re-educate all of these truck drivers? And of course, part of the problem is that right now is that is that if you re-educate them, they're going to become a greeter at Walmart, uh, making a lot less than they did driving that truck. So there has to be those jobs you were talking about, those tech jobs that are being created need to, I guess, move a little faster to, so that we have a place to put all the displaced workers. So yeah. that's definitely a problem. But, you know, that's, I'm, well, it's a political issue, I guess, but you, know, <laughs> yeah. you, you might say it's for government, you know, it's the government's responsibility whether the Canadian or the U.S. or whatever, but, uh, you know, to do something with all these displaced workers. And, and that's, you know, and that applies to marketers as well. You know, a lot of lower level marketers will get displaced by all of the, the this automation. So it's going to be more competitive than ever. So because you kind of uh, you you work a lot with uh, with marketing, right? So um, would you say that you focus a lot with social media or do you what's like your main focus? Like, what do you find is, is the most productive with what you're. Uh... Well, I, you know, I, uh, what I tend to look at is, is the meanings of brands, uh, you know, why we really buy the products that, that we buy and, and you know, the benefits of the, of those products and social media is one way to communicate some of those benefits. But at the end of the day, you still need a strong brand that's like an umbrella that you put everything that you do underneath that um, umbrella. So social media in that sense is just another tool in the toolkit. Um, you know, it's a very powerful tool, but it's, it doesn't replace an, anything else. It doesn't replace traditional advertising. It has a different function. You know, it's more about awareness and, and so on. Um, but, but again, it's just a tool. And the objective is to create a meaning that people really want to own, you know, that they that they want to have, whether it's a, a car or a, a garment or a home or a university or, you know, you you name it. Uh, we have very strong meanings that are associated with these brands. And that's what people are buying They're When they buy, a, 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 especially a consumer product, they're buying a story. They want to know the story and they want to be part of the story. And that's why some of the you know, the, the the brands that everybody talks about when they talk about successful brands, you know, Nike, Apple, Lululemon, a Canadian company and so on. Um, you know, they're not talking about the functionality of the of what they make. They're talking about the experience that the customer has when they interact with that company. And that is something that their competitors have not been able to replicate. They can replicate the functional products, but they can't replicate the story behind a Nike or an Apple. Yeah. And that's, you know, that's like Simon Sinek's books, you know, start with why, you know, what is, what is your, why, what is your story? And, you know, you look at Nike, a lot of their story is this athlete that, you know, went and won Olympic gold and, you know, how hard they worked, but they wore Nike shoes, but they don't really focus too much on shoes. They focus on the fact that that person was going to win that was they worked hard every day they put in the work they put in all that but they did wear our nike shoes right but they don't really focus too much on that it's all about the lifestyle exactly. of wearing that brand right you know and you look at like say a car manufacturer a car manufacturer their story might be about our goal is to be number one in driver safety and get your family from point A to point B safely. Right. You know, that kind of stuff. So we're the best in impact and blah, blah, blah. You know, that's the kind of stuff you're talking about is focusing on that. What's your story, you know? Yeah. Yeah. The story yeah. is everything. <laughs> and you know, what I say to managers, when I, when I give talks and so on, I tell them, look, if you don't, if you think I'm, I'm being silly, and you can't think of a story for your brand, you probably have a problem. 
<laughs> because your customers also, if you can't tell the story, your customers certainly can't tell the story and they're desperate to tell the story. That's, that's what we're buying. Yeah. I mean, I have so many customers that tell me a story of why they're getting a dash cam and it's always, you know, because we've moved to a no fault insurance here in this province and people are being blamed for collisions they weren't even in because they didn't have video evidence. So they're investing in a dash camera so that next time they can prove the other person was at fault. Or if they were at fault, at least they can now know they were at fault and move forward, close the case quickly instead of, you know, waiting a few years going through courts and everything, right? So, sure. but, you know, that's the whole thing is providing that video evidence. But yeah, no, I'm just, I've been looking at this uh, types of markets, market segmentation uh, diagram here, and it's, you know, geographic, demographic, behavioral, and psychographic <laughs> segmentation. Um, mm -hmm. Was was there anything else you wanted to, to, uh, to discuss or bring up or share with our viewers or? Well, again, I think, you know, as, as part of this, because we can't just sit back and rely on, you know, NBC, uh, NBC or, you know, whatever the major television stations are to just kind of tell us what our lives should be like, we, we, we need to motivate our customers to work a lot harder to tell the story with us. You know, that's what's changing today. And so the biggest challenge, you know, I tell this to my students, the single big, biggest challenge any marketer faces is just getting the attention of your customers because there's so many distractions, you know, there's so many other messages out there and so on. And, and so, you know, getting in, get understanding how to engage that customer and make them want to talk to you as opposed to you just, you know, spoon feeding them, which is the old model. Today, it has to be about the customer who opts in voluntarily, who, you know, you've started to tell your story. They say, oh, tell me more. I want to hear that. And of course, you know, it's it's much easier to sell to someone who wants what you're buying, obviously. And uh, and and therefore the, the key challenge for your, I think for your listeners, it is, you know, how can I get my customers to think of me as more than just, you know, a parts store or you know, whatever it is you're you're selling? How can I get them to think about my story and make that a story that they want to be a part of? So yeah. customer engagement is is really the key today. And it's a big challenge. And it, we've created a monster, you know, because we've given people so many different ways to spend their time and only 24 hours in a day. So, you know, uh, last I checked, the average person, a younger person in, in the Western world spends almost 12 hours a day looking at some kind of screen. So uh you've got to work really hard to compete with that yeah that's it's very true because you do need to you know I, I buy these uh protein bars and that company with their crm they don't just like buy 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 because that's what a lot of people do with their crm they're trying to constantly sell you and every couple days i get an email like you know have you tried heating it up in a microwave and putting it into a smoothie because you know a lot of people are saying this is pretty wicked this is what we do right you know uh this is a good workout to go with your protein bar this is a good you know so they're they're always trying to do things like hey we have this challenge going on would you like to be part of our challenge instead of just trying to say hey buy more protein bars you know or why don't you buy this don't be wrong probably once a week i get a whole we have this new product we should do this but they're trying yeah. to add value to their brand and complement the in, the information and i think a lot of people yeah. focus on selling in the transaction instead of trying to complement the story of what that product is going to do for you right yeah. to get the best out of this product we recommend working out or or doing this or whatever right right so it's yeah it's you know moving away from a transactional model to a relationship model where you know, we talk a lot more today about lifetime customer value, which is a metric that you use, you know, how much, not how much is the customer buying from you this month, but how much are they buying forever, you know, and looking, taking that long-term perspective, which is often hard, especially if you're a small business person, you know, to think beyond the next quarter. But if you have the luxury to do it, that's how you build these long-term relationships. And, you know, a lot of small businesses during the pandemic found this out, right? The ones I'm sure it was the same in your area, 
uh, you know, the restaurants and other stores that had that had a strong relationship with the community. People went out of their way to patronize them when all the restaurants were suffering. Whereas if it was a restaurant that was, you know, people just didn't know it, then, you know, it just went under. So I think people, you know, the ones who had built a relationship with their customers over many years were vindicated during the lockdown because they were rewarded to some extent with with that loyalty. Yeah. Yeah. And it takes a long time to build a brand. It doesn't happen overnight. Right. And, you know, a lot of people, you know, uh, we're looking, you know, they're growing up in this Instagram and Facebook phase where it's instant gratification and they see online of somebody standing next to Lamborghini and they think that that person's 22 years old and is, is a multimillionaire. Now, sure, there's probably a few people who played the Bit Bitcoin game and got lucky early on. Right. But um, there's this like uh, fake narrative that you can get rich quick and, and you really can't. You have to build your brand for long term success. At least that's what I fully believe in, is yeah. if you take a long time building your brand, you will be successful long term. If you're trying to get rich quick, you know, you can also get poor quick because <laughs> you're, you're not you're not focusing on the long term vision. You're focusing on the transaction of just closing something today. Um, do you have any final words for everybody and our listeners? Um, well, I just say, you know, thank you for having me on. If anybody's interested in in learning more about, you know, what I do and, and so on, you're you're welcome to visit my website at michaelsolomon.com. There's some free resources there you can download. You can learn more about my customer engagement course and so on. And uh, happy to hear from you. Yeah. And uh, that's how they would get a hold of you is basically michaelsolomon.com. Perfect. Yeah. We'll put that in information in there. I appreciate you coming on. Thanks a lot. Thank you. It was fun. Thanks for listening to the Focus on Customer Experience podcast. 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 Be sure to subscribe wherever you get your podcasts so you never miss an episode. For more information or to connect with Ben, check out Benjamin Del Grosso on LinkedIn at Safe Drive Solutions on Instagram or www.safedrivesolutions.ca online. We'll see you next time.